So this game kind of came out of nowhere, hey? Hello everybody, I am Tom and you are watching my first impressions for Pal World. So to begin, right off the bat, I'll lead with the most pertinent information. Is it good? In short, yes, I kind of love it. The caveat of course being that you need to enjoy the kind of survival game genre, but for context, I downloaded this on my day off and I started playing around 3 in the afternoon and I got off at 3.30am. It ruined my productive day, so take that for what you will. Taking it back to the basics though, for those living under a walk, what exactly is Pell World? Well, the moniker of Pokemon with guns is passed around quite a lot, which while not entirely inaccurate... I'm gonna explain this to you. Do you see that? You see how it looks like a Pokemon? That's Pell World. That's how it works. It's not the most accurate. I feel like Pal World is most accurately described as Ark with a Pokemon skin on top. A lot of the base survival mechanics are quite similar to Ark Survival Evolved, and somewhat brilliantly, by adding the Pokemon Coat of Paint, they've made the most tedious and annoying part of Ark, i.e. the catching of your dinosaurs, into a more enjoyable and streamlined process. So in essence, it's a survival game. You have the mandatory hunger, stamina and crafting mechanics, and you build a base up over time and set about automating it with your pals as you explore around the world, collecting, leveling, finding blueprints to craft better and better gear, all that kind of stuff. As you load into the game, you wake up with naught but the skin on your back and a set of basic instructions to get you started. I actually think the tutorial is really well done here. Honestly, a lot of survival games don't really give you a lot of direction, which I guess is part of the charm. However, because of the layered aspects of Pal World, they give you a quick tutorial. It's in the form of a list of objectives just on the side. It tells you how to get your first base started up and running, how to capture your first pals. This set of objectives is always there on your screen, but it's never particularly pushy with its tutorialization. Indeed, if you're so inclined or you're on a subsequent character, you can largely just ignore the tutorial and freely do whatever you wish. It never forces you to do anything in the tutorial, it's simply there for new players when they need it. But after learning the basics of crafting and making Pal Spheres, Pal Spheres? Pokeballs. I'm sure neither Pocket Pair, the company making Pal World, or Nintendo particularly like this comparison, but they're Pokeballs. That's just what they are. I'll also potentially refer to Pals as Pokemon at some point in this video, because I've just been using those terms interchangeably as I've been playing, but back to topic. After making your first Pokeballs, you can set out and catch some of the basic Pals running around. At the starting area, there's generally three that are going to be really, really common. You have Chikopees, Kativas, and Lamballs. Rather than catching the pals that you want to and making a team, quote unquote, you're actively encouraged to capture as many pals and duplicates of pals as you can, a notable first number being 10 of each pal, as this will give you a stacking XP bonus for each repeated pal you catch. And XP is primarily obtained by catching pals. So if you catch 10 Lambles, the first Kativa you catch will give you more experience. And then the first, you get 10 more Kativas, that'll keep adding to that XP bonus, so that every Pokemon you catch after that point will give you more and more XP. Additionally, when you get a bit further into Pal World, you will start powering up your pals. The only real way I'm saying that you can do this, because this is kind of how it's described in game, is you're feeding the souls of duplicates into the one that you want to buff. This game does get kind of dark. It's got some dark undertones at some times, but, you know, you know. But doing so takes, like, around 100 pals of the same thing, so if you want a really powerful Lamble, you're gonna have... I think it's 100 and, what is it, 112, 116 Lambles into that one Lamble to max it out. So it does take quite a few, so you want to be catching as many as you can pretty much whenever you see them. Uh, you want to just catch things. If you're not, if you're running past it and you're thinking of killing it, catch it instead is generally the, uh, the idea. You have plenty of storage, so it's not really an issue. But then, you're really on your way. You're exploring, you're crafting, you're capturing. And the main gameplay loop is established. Now the basics are out of the way, let's talk about a couple of the more specifics that I really, really enjoy. To start off with, it's worth noting that this is a first impressions video. At the time of writing, I've only got 20-ish hours of playtime. It's sure to be more by the time this uploads. But this means that some of these features might bore me as time goes on. But as of now, the gameplay avenues I'm seeing, I'm really, really getting engaged with. First off, I want to talk about the pals themselves. They're essentially Pokemon. Um, there are a set of monsters, you go out there and you collect them, and as far as I can tell, they serve three main functions. Firstly, is the most simple, yet probably understated quite a lot, which is the nature of collecting. There is a Pokedex feature, which gives you information on the kind of the pals and how they do, but you fill that out as you capture all the various creatures throughout the game. Secondly, you can use them in combat. Each pal has a set of moves it knows and can use in combat, just like Pokemon. 
You can have up to five pals in your team at any given point, and you send one out to fight alongside you. So you run around with a weapon and you're fighting, but anything you're engaged in combat with, the pal will also be attacking if you send it out. And the final use for pals is base utility. Each pal has a set of things they can do around the base, and it's this that really makes the base building compelling for me, because the pals you place there will run around automating a lot of the processes for you. For instance, you might have one pal in your farm producing milk or wool, and you'll have another one chopping down trees, and there'll be another one mining minerals, and you'll have still more running around picking up all those resources and going and putting them in chests for you. So it's a really satisfying puzzle to solve of how you're going to focus your base and which pals you're going to put in there to automate the things that you don't want to keep doing manually. It's really, really fun. I love it a lot. Next up is exploring the world, which is still very, very fun to me at this point. It's set up into regions with kind of predetermined level ranges. So you have your starter islands, which are kind of the, the range of 1 to 15, and you go all the way up to more advanced regions that go all the way up to like level 40 to 50. The world itself is really, really pretty. Um, the art style is a kind of cartoony aesthetic, which is always more timeless than a more grounded art direction. It's also, unfortunately for Pocket Pair, which is the company that makes the game, it really adds to the uh, they're stealing from Pokemon arguments that a lot of the naysayers are putting around at the moment. But, you know, big eyed cartoon style is very reminiscent of Pokemon. It's kind of their thing, right? Um, anytime you get a little monster, give it really big eyes and make it cute, it looks like Pokemon, because that's all Pokemon is. But I do think that the art direction overall really adds to the charm of the game. Adding to the enjoyment of the exploration is the fact that quite a few of the pals can be ridden as mounts, with both speeds up the exploration process for both in the ground and in the air, because there are flying mounts and ground mounts. And let's face it, mounts are always cool. It doesn't matter what game you're in, everybody loves mounts. Particularly when they're really aesthetically diverse, like this game, because they're all just monsters, right? You're riding around on Pokemon. Everyone loved that feature when they put it in Pokemon, and then they took it away for some reason. Anyway, the capturing is also very fun. My only complaint being that you tend to quickly out-level a lot of the things you want to be capturing, so the pals in your team start just one-shotting any of the Pokemon you want to capture, which means you have to spend a lot of time by yourself just carrying around basic weapons so you can do a little bit of damage to the low-level pals so you can catch them which takes away from kind of the fighting with your monsters fantasy that the game is really quite good at, and that happens relatively quickly early on. Granted, I can go to the higher level areas and it's not as much of an issue, but it, it, the scaling of it is just a bit off. It feels like you want to stay in that earlier area a bit longer, and you're, you get to the point where you're so powerful that everything you have just one-shots it, so you've got, to, you've got to kind of nerf yourself a bit to be able to catch the, the pals that you want. Additionally, as kept around the map are dungeons and bosses. The dungeons are a fairly standard affair, you get into a random generation of wild pals and you make your way through, you capture and you fight all the things until you get to the end, but there is a boss, which you can also capture. Pretty much everything in this game you can capture. Uh, the only thing that I don't think you're supposed to be able to capture, I think you can currently, but I'm pretty sure it's a bug, is there are towers that you can go to, and in these towers there are, I mean for want of a better term, it's like a gym battle. You go in there and you fight like a big pal with a person on top of it. That's the other thing. I forgot to put this in my script. I'm just going off script for the moment here. You can catch people in this. Everything counts as a pal. You can just catch people. There's these kind of criminal syndicate guys running around. You can just throw a Pokeball at them and catch them and turn them into your slave. It's kind of crazy, but I, I can't believe I forgot to put that in the script. It's kind of a huge deal. Uh, and you can sell them on the black market. It's, as I said, some dark undertones in here. But there are also boss fights. These boss fights are just really big and powerful variants of the normal pals, but the boss fights come in both forms of open world bosses, so they'll just be hanging around in the open world, and there are bosses that you enter via these kind of special little teleporters that are essentially just a one-room dungeon where you just, it's like an arena fight with the boss, that's all it is. Um, often seems to be that there are rare repels that you can't ordinarily catch at the level that you fight them for these boss fights. Uh, for instance, pretty early on there is a Chillet boss fight, which is like a, it's like a dragon ferret. Quite cool. But that's a level 11 fight, and ordinarily you can only catch Chillet out in the wild at around the level 20-ish areas is where you start seeing them. Uh, so you can actually catch some of the later game boss, uh, later game pals early if you encounter them in a boss fight and you manage to catch them in the boss fight. Which is more challenging, to be fair. Uh, they are hard. They have a higher catch rate, so they're harder to catch. However, you can kind of get a, a jump start on those really cool later game pals. 
There's one more mechanic I'd love to talk about, but I want to get onto that a bit later. First off, I want to list some of the negatives so we can do kind of a, uh, a negative sandwich, as you will. You go the positive, negative, positive. Firstly, the most obvious negative is if you're not a big fan of the kind of grindy survival game genre, then you won't likely vibe much with what's here. Uh, it is worth noting that it's pretty much all of the grindy settings are adjustable in your world settings. So if you're playing solo or you have access to the server settings for where you're playing, you can actually adjust all of the rates of pretty much anything in the game to how you like them. So that does alleviate the grind somewhat, uh, but I feel like the survival genre does have a very kind of niche audience. Um, and if you're not part of that audience, you're probably not going to find much here. Palo World is also an early access indie game, and that comes with everything one might expect. There's bugs, there's crashes, there's memory leaks, a whole host of other things that take away from what you might call polish. Uh, but compared to other early access titles, I've found my experience to be fairly smooth, all things considered. Most of my woes come from the fact that I'm playing on a server with my friends, and there are occasional rubber banding and lag spike issues. Uh, so if you're playing solo, none of the issues I'm having you will have, pretty much. Uh, but it's far from unplayable for me, even on the server I'm playing on. But it is worth being aware of that there are some obvious issues from early access. Finally on the negatives is just the pathing on the pals in your base is often horrendous. Uh, you'll sometimes find them, they've got themselves stuck up a tree or behind a rock or something, and they're just slowly starving to death because they can't reach the food bowl. And until you notice that and move them manually, they'll just be stuck there in perpetuity until they fall unconscious. Uh, the pathing in the AI instruction, <coughs> excuse me, the pathing in the AI instruction could be a lot better than it currently is. And they, I think they need to, uh, I don't know what it is. I think maybe loosen up the, the tightness of what they can do. Like maybe change some, some hit boxes to make them a bit small so they can get, get past certain things. Quite often you will find them stuck up a tree. I've noticed that quite a bit. Uh, the final thing I want to touch on is a fantastic feature, which is the breeding system. The system in itself is actually quite simple. You find a male and a female pal, you put them in the breeding pen and then add some cake and you'll create an egg. Apparently sex is only initiated with cake. Anyway, the nuance of the system comes from the fact that any two pals can breed. And as far as I can tell, each and every pal in the game has a bunch of recipes for want of a better term, for creating it specifically through breeding. For example, I found that if you breed a Chillet and a Quiven, both of which can be attained relatively early on from pretty early level boss fights, you will result in a Rocky Egg. When you hatch that Rocky Egg, you get an Anubis, which is really good at helping you craft. It has like level four handiwork. So anything you're crafting, if you have him helping you, he's gonna speed it up huge amounts. An additional thing that breeding enables is to be able to get the best version of the pal you want. You see, each pal has up to four modifiers that give either positive buffs or negative debuffs, which do everything from making them eat way more food on the negative side to making them work with 30% more efficiency on the positive side. But these traits are genetically tied to the pals, which means you can pass them down the desired trait through breeding. I'll walk through an example here for context. Uh, Rayhound is a nice early to mid game land mount. It's really quite fast just by default. It can also double jump, which makes traversal really, really easy when you want to run around the areas. But since we're using it primarily as a mount, we don't really care for work speed or even attack. So what we want is just to stack as much movement speed as possible. With breeding, you can pass all that down with the relevant traits. So there is the swift, the runner and the nimble trait, which gives 30%, 20% and 10% movement speed respectively. However, they all stack additively, so you get a total of 60% movement speed. Ideally, you'd also have the legend trait, which adds an additional 15%, as well as some attack and defense on top, but that's quite a late game trade, so I'll ignore it for now. That's quite hard to get. But when you combine all these traits, with inbreeding, really, is the easiest way to do it, just like with Pokemon and, sadly, real life, I guess. Incest is wincest when it comes to making genetically perfect thoroughbreds. But combining all of these makes a really fast mount, and the same concept can be applied when you're making a really strong fighter or a really efficient worker. This kind of optimization and min-maxing really fires the dopamine in my brain and really motivates me to grind. It's just, ooh, I like it so much. But with that, we're at the end of my kind of first impressions for Power World. Really, really good. I'm liking it a lot. It's one of those really addicting games where you're sitting there and you're just playing for hours and hours and hours and then you check the clock and you're like, oh, I've been playing for hours and hours and hours and it feels like you've barely been playing. Um, I'm sure I'm going to be playing this game ad nauseum for the foreseeable future. And as for now, it has my seal of approval and my recommendation, particularly because I haven't even mentioned this yet, but it is only 35 bucks, um, US that is. 
Uh, and for that money, I feel like I've already got my money's worth with just what I've played at this point, which feels like more of a rarity these days with games. However, if you got all the way through the video, thanks for watching. Like, subscribe if you haven't already, all that kind of jazz. And I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching, guys.